This episode of Living the Dram is proudly brought to you by Rupert's Pet Cremation and Transport. Rupert's Pet Cremation and Transport offers individual pet cremations on the Central Coast. They aim to ease the grief associated with losing a beloved pet by providing a compassionate and respectful service. Rupert's fully trained and caring team will look after everything from collection to the return of your pet's ashes all within four business days. They have a range of urns to choose from and you can personalise the plaque with your own inscription. Furthermore, each cremation package comes with a free memorial box with a range of keepsakes. You can also customise your package by adding a framed paw print mould and or garden memorial stone. More information is available at www.rpct.com.au and you can mention Living the Dram podcast for a free paw print mould with your cremation package. Conditions apply. Rupert's Pet Cremation and Transport, they treat your pet like their own. It's bloody good to be back, Mick. Ah, oh, isn't it good to be back, Rickus? It's, it's been a while coming. It has. We've, uh, we've had a, um, a fair break between the last one and this one. Sure, I have a lot. A lot has gone down. A lot of, a lot of, the, the world's had to see a lot in the last uh, a little while. Yeah, well, just, yeah, six months, mm. six months or so. Yeah, even locally, we are, not that you'd really be able to tell, but we are broadcasting from a new location. True. Yeah, living with LTD Studios has, uh, has shifted. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, this, um, don't want to harp on about it, everybody's probably bored to fucking tears with it, but this whole, this whole COVID, COVID thing has really, uh, Really fucking slowed a lot of things down. Rona, the Rona. I uh, I hadn't heard of it. Uh, it's uh, just recently come to my attention, but um, it seems to be fucking a whole bunch of where, things. Where, up. where have you been, Melbourne or something? <laughs> Under a rock, <laughs> a rock of my own devising. But yeah, it's been a it's been a challenging time. I'm sure for everyone listening, as well as uh, everyone not listening, it's just been a really fucked mm. up time for everyone. Yeah. So our thoughts and best wishes go out for everyone that's struggling. And hopefully a dram or two of fine whiskey will mm. make things just a little bit better. Cure all. Yeah. Panacea. Uh, what was it? Amber amber restorative. <laughs> <laughs> if you if yeah, if you want to check out a previous episode. But today today we've headed to a oh, one of the one of the big players, yeah. I would I would say in the in the Scotch world, certainly in the um, in the sherry finish world. Oh, definitely, definitely. Uh, but one of the one of the old, uh, oldest and still family run distilleries mm. uh, in Scotland. A lot of history there. Oh yeah, yes. There's six generations. Mm, six I generations. think generations. They're in the sixth. Have gone into uh, the Valley of the Green Grass, mm. most commonly known as. The Glen Farkless Distillery. Indeed. Well done. Mm. So yeah, Speyside Distillery out of uh, Belinda Loch. Or, yeah, I, I'm having a crack at that. Belin- yeah. yeah, Belinda that, Loch sounds good. That's Ro- the Australian the pronunciation. Yeah. Yeah. Ballandalloch. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, get straight into it, really, as I, as I alluded to earlier, the... Uh, translates to mean the valley of the green grass it does yeah in probably gaelic or scottish scottish gaelic, gaelic. yeah you know, i'm not a linguist oh, it's, it's in one language only <laughs> yeah um glenn farkless six stills which are the largest in space has a production capacity of about three and a half million liters of spirit per year, and normally they only use four of the six stills, uh, two of them are kept in reserve. Uh, they double distill their spirit, and the malt that they use is typically local, often from a moray. Although I don't know how <laughs> a couple of my mates in my football team are Irish. And I asked them, like, if they lived far away from each other and their first, like, their instinctual um, 
response was like, yeah, yeah, actually. Actually, by Australian standards, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what a Scott thinks of, like, uh, if you're in Belinda Lock, how far away Moray is. Like, it could be a world away. Yeah, right. Or um, it could be, yeah. Or for, yeah. I, I have for no us, idea. I'd call, like, I've driven three hours to go for a mountain bike ride. Like, it's, it's, I'd call that, like, it's not too far. It's far, but it's not too far. Oh, look, if I've got to drive for three hours, I want there to be a reward at the end of it so mm. you know for a holiday or something like that i'll, yeah. I'll drive but you know I've, I've been known to I've drive got... up to 12 hours to get away from uh to get somewhere where there's a reward but well, yeah. see scotland you'd be in another fucking country by then i reckon yeah if you drove at 110 for 12 hours you'd probably be, be in france be in Spain, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you don't you don't know what you got actually i wouldn't want to be in spain at the moment but that's a that's a different can of worms altogether no well that that's that's very true and um in the lead up to this, um, and uh, and shout out to uh, Matt Redden from angove.com.au. Uh, Thank you very much, Matt. For uh, for uh, facilitating uh, some information and, and tasting notes, etc. After we got in touch with him, um, but he said that they were uh, the there'd been trouble getting stock uh, mm. over from Scotland. Obviously, yeah. it takes a long time for. Um, shipments to get here and, and everything's been kind of fucked up with uh, with the, the COVID-19 situation. Mm. Uh, thankfully, we're not going to run out of whiskey in Australia anytime soon, but you'd certainly... Not uh, in my cabinet either. You'd, you'd certainly... Uh, I, I, I really feel for the, uh, the people in Europe, France, Spain, UK, especially uh, at the time that we're recording, they're staring down the barrel of a second wave, which... Um, yeah, Victoria's been going through for some time down here, so we'll certainly um, yeah, hoist a dram in their direction and mm. wish them all the best. But we uh, we certainly uh, don't we, we don't want to see the whiskey disappear, do we? No. So no. get your shit together, people. I think I alluded to in a in a previous episode that yeah, a lot of the um. A lot of the distilleries have have really wound things back, mm. which is getting a, a little bit scary. Mm. Getting a little a little bit scary. We'll see that. We'll see the impact of that in a couple of years' time. Mm. You know, we haven't seen yeah, it yet. Yeah, exactly. Will. It'll come down exactly. uh, down the line a little bit. We'll see the impacts of of what's going on. Mm. However, I don't know if Glenn Farkless will have too much of a worry. They've got it, apparently approximately sixty eight thousand casks maturing on site. Just a couple. Yeah, just a couple. Uh, in traditional Dunnage warehouses, they have stock from every year, from 1954 to the current year. Wow. Which is which is a mad pedigree. Yeah, because they do some family casks, don't they? Yeah, every yeah, year when yeah. They select the cask from a particular year. Yeah. That's you know to have that kind of stock. That's that's really good yeah. planning. Yeah. Really good management. I think the family cast might have started from 52, maybe. Yeah, right. But they don't have any more of the 52 or 53 on site. But still, that's... A, no, that's incredible. <laughs> that is that is amazing. What is, what is that? That's 66 yeah. years. That's, that's wicked. And they produce a pretty traditional Highland malt with a very heavy sherry influence. And... Um, Mick has managed to dig up a bit of dirt on on the sherry influence, I, which I, uh, I did. I went down a bit of a, a sherry rabbit hole, and I I must admit I was surprised, was shocked, yeah. mm. and I yeah. You know, I mean, for some people it may not uh, be news at all, but I found it really interesting. So we'll we'll get into that a little yeah, bit later I'm because looking uh, forward to hearing more about yeah, that. You yeah. sort of yeah, you just sort of cracked open the door a little bit for me earlier mm. and um it's it's yeah it's not all i thought it was no and if my sources are correct i think Len farkless have moved to mature or finish basically all their stocks now in 100 percent of their stocks are maturing in x sherry yeah wow x sherry bots i think i think which is it's just a Pretty expensive undertaking by by normal standards. Mm, it is. Sometimes sherry cask can cost up to ten times what a, a bourbon cask costs. Yeah, and you've got to have them made specially. Mm-hmm. 
Now, I know that sounds weird to, you know, maybe the average listener, what, that they have them made specially, but, yeah, it's it's not, or maybe as you think, but it certainly wasn't as what I thought, mm. the, the process of uh, sherry cask finishing. All in good time. Mm. The distillery is aided by, uh, they have a bit of a microclimate happening there, which limits their evaporation loss, apparently, to 0.05%. Hey, well, angel share is usually 2%, so that's exactly. a significant well, yeah, saving. Industry average of about 25 mm. so that's that's insane. Uh, there's evidence that the distillery first started operating sometime before 1791, most likely illegally, as they all were, a lot of bootleggers around. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were first granted a licence, however, in 1836, and it was run by a gentleman by the name of Robert Hay. Little sidestep, the Grants, a well-off family, operated a farm near Glenlivet, and John Grant was a well-known cattle breeder who ended up buying the Glen Farkless Distillery at Rechelich, Rechelich, (laughs) Rechelich, I'll go Rechelich, farm on the 8th of June, 1865, at, at the ripe old age of 60, as the land was basically a, an ideal halfway staging post between his farm in Glenlivet and where the cattle market was in nearby Elgin. Uh, the farm, oh, just incidentally, nice little little tidbit, ran all the way up until 1988. Yeah, wow. Apparently the sale was out of the blue and Hay went on to acquire a shop at 251 High Street in Elgin where he operated as a grocer and a spirit dealer. Uh, the reasons for the sale were pretty well unclear. Uh, apparently, Hay and his wife Jane were not in any financial distress, but it's possible that they were both in sort of ill health. Uh, although relative, relatively young, uh, both were dead within three years of the sale. Oof. Yeah, pretty rough. Uh, Robert, you know, like a, a bit of an archaic uh, diagnosis, but he, uh, July 1867 left this earth from organic disease of the stomach. Oh, wow. And Jane less than a year later from breast cancer. Mm. Uh, Their only surviving son, Peter, was orphaned at the age of 13, which that's brutal. Mm. And that's uh, in 1871, when Peter was 16, um, he was recorded as lodging in the house of his uncle, who was a woodcutter named William Dallas. And Peter was employed as a jeweller in Elgin. And after this, Peter disappears from the written record. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a little bit about the original owners, the Hayes. We'll move on to uh, the Grants, who purchased the distillery. The distillery was purchased for £511.19. shillings. Now, you're good at this kind of conversion stuff. What would that be in today's dollars? You know what? This is... The first time I've failed on this note. I'll get back to you, Barry. Excellent. And since farming was Grant's priority, he sent his son George to look after Reclaric Farm uh, while he sublet the distillery to a distant cousin, John Smith. Now, am I correct in recalling that that's the same John Smith that, after leaving, went on to found Cragenmore Distillery? Mm. One shot wonder. And John took his son George uh, into partnership after John Smith left in 1870. Um, it was also the year that George married Elsie Gordon and they went on to have five kids. The two eldest sons, John and George. <laughs> this gets quite confusing. Uh, <laughs> this gets quite, quite confusing. Uh, shortly after... John Grant passed away and he left George to run the distillery and the farm. But sadly, only a year later, George followed suit. So Elsie took up the license and cracked the whips over the sons, John and George. Good honour. Keep it in the family, man. It's, it's not really slave labour, but it is. Nah, no, no, no. You know, your kids are there to work, That's especially it. in those days. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. In August 1896, at the height of the whiskey boom, John and George formed a partnership. 
uh, the Glen Livet, Flachless Glen Livet Distillery Company with the Pattersons of Leith. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Oh, well, wow, those poor f- buggers. Yeah, yeah, they had no idea. Who was to know? Though? Well, Who no was one was. That there's a reason it was called the Patterson Crash. Mm. Hmm. So they held a 50% stock. Um, <laughs> I love, I'm going to quote this. But it was going to prove to be a troublesome partnership. And one, obviously it dissolved. It left John and George in a bit of a predicament and it took at least another 15 years. And, um, a lot of family commitment to, it, to basically dig them out of that hole. Yep. Rebuild uh, financial dis- stability. And I'm guessing it took its toll on John because he retired due to ill health in 1913. George became sole proprietor. Uh, the early years of George's tenure as custodian of the distillery were a period of rapid growth and expansion. He's, he had his shit sorted, nice. young George. Uh, and at this time, production doubled due to high demand from the blenders. Now, was that was there a was it that time that the Excise Act allowed for? Because I remember originally before the Excise Act was part, and I can't remember what year, but you weren't allowed to. Uh, you weren't allowed to work on a Sunday and you could only do one, run one mash ton or something like that. And then that yeah, was legislated, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, down the track. Uh, mind you, this, nah, is a, that this is a useless... Uh, in, no, 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 that, that, wasn't until, that wasn't until 1950, apparently. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was a bit, yeah, a little bit later on. Um, it was actually George that designed the Glenn Farkless script. Apparently it was his signature of how he wrote Glenn Farkless. But the only change since then has been the R because they reckon the R was like the old style R where it looked a uh, little bit like a U. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, none of these bottles have the old style on there. No, no, they're all the new. They're all the new versions. In 21, George married Jesse Stewart Scott and they had two sons, George and John. <laughs> Yeah. Original. Yeah, yeah. Maybe there's a shortage of names back then. Oh, well, know. yeah. It's, it's obviously, yeah. There weren't a lot of Johns and Georges around. So it was a rare <laughs> name and they just kept using it. They, yeah. they didn't want to give it up. Mm-mm. In 1930, they bought the lease of the Belinda Lock Estate. In 47, Glenn Farkless became a private limited company owned by George and John. And in 1950s, the repeal of the 1880 Spirit Act. So that's a long time. That's 70 years of, yeah. of. I struggle to understand why those would have been like law. Well, it would have been probably religious. Yeah. Like not not working on a Sunday. The, 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 and it probably would have been about ton? control, as well. Yeah. Like, that, that by only having one mash ton, it means that you can only then produce a certain amount of spirit. Um, uh, th- that's the only thing I can think of. I didn't look into yeah. you know, that repeal. While we're on to mash tons, I do have a note here that um, the semi lower to mash ton at Glen Farkless measures 10 metres wide and with a 16 and a half ton capacity is probably the largest mash ton in the industry. Okay. Hmm. Is that the one also? It's, uh, it's stainless steel. It's not typical pine, I believe. Yes. Yeah, yeah. that's correct. Yeah. Uh, basically... The repeal of that 1880 Spirit Act effectively doubled capacity mm. now. And also there's the relaxation of the wartime barley rationing. Um, so, yeah, production really, really yep. started going, escalating. Uh, I've got a quote from the current George <laughs> <laughs> uh, that says, In 1952, 96% of what they were making was sold to blenders. Wow. Hmm. Crazy. I suppose it was profitable. You mm. know? That's yeah, That was the trend at the time. Yeah. But mind you, thankfully, they kept enough stock that they were able to age uh, and have you know stuff still in well, the tanks. The reason why that they, they kept the stock was because in um, the 1960s, they lost a major blending contract from Diageo. It was really? basically their largest company, a customer. Yeah. And so George made the shrewd decision to lay down stock for the distillery's own bottlings rather yep. than rely on the blenders. Brilliant. 
and thanks to his foresight, they have an abundance of age stocks which yeah. continue to be sold, such as we never even introduced. We it. haven't introduced. No, what no, we're doing jump today. the jump the gun a no. bit. It's it's been too long. Yeah, you know, look, you forgive us if shaky stuff. Forgive, forgive us if we're a little rusty. Yeah, yeah, it's it's been a while since uh since we've gotten together. <laughs> One point five meters. Yeah, so yeah, we're <laughs> socially distancing. <laughs> So yeah, we're going to start with the 15-year-old today. We are. And then uh, move up to the ripe old age of, of 21. But we have something extra special. We have. We've uh, what, purchased sp- specifically for the podcast. We've uh, got ourselves a bottle of the 25-year-old. Lashed out on mm. 25, which I'm, I'm looking forward to. I've only ever... Got to sample the tiniest little bit once, I believe. Yeah, right. And I think it was with you. Uh, I don't know if I've tried the 25. Um, and, and I've tried the 15. I'm not oh. sure if I've tried the 21 or the 25. Okay. From my memory, I the 15 blew me away and the 21 left me hanging. Okay. Um, but maybe in comparison today, I um, could change my mind. You never know. I've seen it happen. I've seen it. <laughs> but yeah, young young George that responsible for the for the script. Uh he remained he was a champion for fifty two years, which is pretty good innings. Yeah, it is. And throughout nineteen seventies distillery continued to prosper. New blending contracts were signed, the distillery was expanded. Uh it was one of the first distilleries to ever open a visitor centre in nineteen seventy three. You know me, Rick. Yep. I love a business centre. <laughs> I've, yep, it's on my bucket list. It's on my bucket list. And it's highly recognisable owing to the uh, iconic decommissioned Doig ventilator that now resides at top of the entrance to the building, which was, was once used on site um, in the in the on-site floor maltings yeah. until they ceased floor malting that's, in 72. That's what I, I thought I'd read that, that they, um, you know, that was, they originally did maltings on site and mm. that's what, why it adorns their visitor centre very impressively because they don't do mm. in-house maltings Yeah, anymore. it's got a really, um, uh, it's got a really iconic sort of Asian style look about it, like sort of yeah. a Chinese architecture. But you might remember the, uh, the name Doeg. Uh, Charles Doig, actually. That rings a bell. Yeah, well, it should, because he was also responsible for Ardbeg, Belle Blair, Kaililla, Dufftown, Highland Park, Lefroig, uh, Pulteney, Speyburn, Talisker, and Abalur. Did this dude just build distilleries and that's all he did? He was an architect, yeah. yeah he just designed. What a, that's Absolute ninja. That is a hell of a resume, mm-hmm. isn't it? What a pedigree. Wow. Uh, the visitor's centre, actually, sorry, I'll go back. They are the pagoda, the dog ventilator, or the pagoda. Uh, <laughs> I love this. Uh, legend says it acts as a beacon to draw whiskey lovers from across the globe to Glen Farkless Distillery. They could be just full of shit, but I still, uh, I still like it anyway. <laughs> I love that. You just get one person that sits there and goes, oh, you heard, yeah, that, that's a... That's a whiskey person magnet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, a legit whiskey person magnet. Yeah. A, what, look, look at all the people coming to the distillery. It must work. I was going to say, you've just got all these stunned people. Like, you're just, uh, <laughs> Where the fuck I am I? I don't know what I'm doing here. Oh, fucking whiskey. Would you oh. like a drum? <laughs> oh, <hey. laughs> So the visitor centre includes a ship's room, which is a tasting room, and it's uh, basically decked out with uh, the strippings from the RMS Empress of Australia. And that was a ship that was a, had a bit of historical importance. It ferried the last British troops home from Bombay, now known as Mumbai, after they'd uh, symbolically passed through the Gateway of India, which brought an end to over two centuries of British imperial rule in India. Yeah, right. Apparently, it's, a, uh, it's quite an impressive place to, to have a dram. Um, I reckon it would be. Yeah, really. It'd be looking. an awesome place to visit. Yeah. It really would be. It's, yeah, it's, it's uh, one of the most impressive distilleries that we've uh, we've looked into. So they traditionally uh, fire the stills, but they trialed steam coil heating in the 1980s, and one of the stills was converted to be indirectly heated, and 
spirit was collected separately from the rest of the regular make. Sensory analysis of the resulting spirit from the steam heat had still revealed that the character of the spirit had just changed beyond recognition. It nosed and tasted nothing like regular Glen Farkless. So the decision was made basically then and there to, to rip out the steam coil heating and go back to the uh, more expensive yet better tasting direct heating. Yeah, and I think the other thing with the steam heating is that it extends the life of the stills because then I'm not direct surprised. Fire. Yeah, yeah, I'm not surprised. So that was one of the things I, I recall reading uh, that they, because they wanted to remain consistent with their spirit, obviously because they had so much stock, they, yeah, they didn't want to just start changing the spirit. Mm -hmm. They went, you know, well, we're happy to replace them a little bit more often to still make right. Glenn Farkless rather than trying to protect the machinery. Okay. I respect that. Yeah, cool. Good on them. Mm. I love that. Every, when you're it's largely a profit-driven world. Oh, exactly. Capitalist society. Yeah. It's, Good it's, on them. It's, it's a disgusting capitalist you know, world. Yeah, and yeah wasteful. At the end of the day, for you know, the things like whiskey should be different i know that's mm -hmm. easy for me to sit behind a microphone and say when i'm not trying to make money out of running a distillery but mm -hmm. yeah some things should be more important than money yeah never forsake flavor no. who's that that's somebody else's slogan isn't it oh it'll be someone's yeah, yeah it sounds very slogany yeah well 1986 marked the 150th anniversary of legal distilling. I like that read, legal <laughs> distilling at Glen Farkless and Sales. I wonder if they had a quiet little party like 30 years earlier. Yeah. And sales, absolutely booming. Single malt sales had grown by a quarter. Production increased again in 87. Uh, another John Grant joined the distillery in 73, the year that the... Uh, Visitor Centre opened. He was appointed as chairman in 2002 and he continues to live and work at the Harlow Distillery today. Cool. Uh, he still checks, John still checks the spirit every week, buys all the malted barley and goes to Spain to oversee the cask buying. Good work. What a legend. Mm. That's a fucking dream job, that is. Oh, yes. And Glenn Farkless, they've been working with the same bodegas since 1988 that are also family owned. Uh, today, all the wood is sourced from Jerez Cooper Miguel Martin. Uh, it's a mix of butts and hogsheads, all ex Oloroso and made from European oak. And the core range is aged in a mix of first fill and refill. George S. Grant, which is a sixth generation of the family, joined the business in 2000 after a short period working for the Hong Kong distributor. He lives and works at the distillery as well as sales director and he frequently visits different markets to further expand international sales. And today, Glen Farkless Highland Single Malt Scotch Whiskey accounts for two-thirds of the distillery's annual production and is sold in over 90 markets worldwide. Small proportion go on to independent bottlers and such as Blair Findy, and the rest assumedly goes to blenders. Although independent bottlers are often prohibited from using the name Glen Farkless on, yes. their, on their bottles, yeah. which is, that's awesome marketing, that is. Yeah, absolutely. It means that on, you have complete control over your brand, which yep. you, you, you should always. Yes. In 2006, they were named Distillery of the Year by Whiskey Magazine, and in 2007... They launched the Family Casks, which is a collection of 43 single cast bottlings, with one from every year from 1952 to 94. Uh, collection now extends to 2001. It probably extends further than that. Mm. Uh, according to my information, could well be out of date. But yeah, as I said earlier, they no longer have stock from 52 or 53. I could love to taste that. Oof. In 2008, the company began sponsoring horse racing with the Glen Farkless Cross Country Handicap Chase at Cheltenham. I wonder if they bought steaks in a stock in a dog food company as well. Those fucking cross country races for oh, horses are so especially, brutal. Especially the steeple chases, man, when they've, yeah, when they've got to so, jump over so you know, 12 jumps over three kilometers. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, it sounds like fun. 
I'm surprised more jockeys don't die, let alone horses. Yeah, look, I mean, over there, I, I don't like. I mean, if it happened here, like, there, there's no steeplechasing in Australia anymore. Yeah, like, there's yeah, there's yeah, none. Yeah. The, the people got so up in arms about it because, for, for fairly reasonable reasons, no, just, you yeah, know, yeah. That's, uh, that's it's not great for horses having people on their back running as fast as they can, jumping over things. Eh, not great. Mm, not great for anyone involved. Nah, except nah. Yeah. And look, don't get me wrong. Yeah, I'm not a teetotaler. I enjoy the racing industry, and and I have the uh, the odd punt. But uh, yeah. hey, there's there's something something different about a 1200 meter race where you're just going straight with a jockey on your back, and a 3000 meter race where you're going around like this, having to jump over things. Yeah. A lot of horses tend to get hurt. The, what is it? The steeplechase, like in like marathon, like just people. That's fucking carnage enough. Yeah. Without throwing a horse in. Yeah, you're not wrong. Yeah, good God. In January 2011, Glenn Farkless released a limited edition bottling to mark the distillery's 175th anniversary. The 40-year-old 46% expression was named Scotch Whiskey Single Malt of the Year in the 17th Annual Malt Advocate Whiskey Awards. In June 2015, they released a number, another limited edition bottling called the 511 pounds 19 shillings uh, family reserve and it was launched to mark the 150 years of the grant family owning the distillery the name of the bottling if you remember back to about half an hour ago refers to the price that he paid for the distillery in 1865 and the bottle is sold with a copy of the original bill of sale of the distillery nice (laughs) that's pretty cool also in 2015, they released a limited edition line of their 60-year-old bottle. Good God. Wow. Yeah. Uh, they confirmed that there were only 360 bottles released globally, and it was cl- crafted in a first fill sherry butt. Uh, it was vibrant, full-bodied flavor, and, and it's one of the last of the 1953 casks. Oh, that'd taste real smooth, mm. I reckon. Um Bloody sweet, mm. I imagine. Yeah, it'd be an utter sherry bomb. Mm. And there's there's the timeline in a nutshell. Lovely. How did I've you get to uh, this nutshell? Because I fucking <laughs> put it there. <laughs> I've got one little um, little note just to, to go with that. Um, so in, as you said, in 21, George Massey married uh, Jesse Stewart Scott. They had a couple of sons. That was during the Second World War. Well, during the Second World War, they served in the forces. Um, when they were demobbed, their father held a party in Elgin in 1947 to celebrate the distillery's supposed centenary, his silver wedding anniversary, and his son's 21st birthdays, all of which had taken place during the war. At the time, it was thought that the Glen Farkless was established in 1845. Subsequently, it was discovered that it was first licensed in 1936. So the, the centenary celebrations was... Nah. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of what nine nine years off yeah. <laughs> it's so oh, it's our 109th celebration but I just like the effort that he went to to kind of get all that stuff together a couple of 21st a silver wedding anniversary yeah. 100 years of the distillery yeah close mm-hmm. I'll get a, a wee bit self indulgent I share a birthday with my grandmother and I've always wanted to like my 18th 21st never actually lined up with anything significant for her, but I always thought it'd be nice if we could have done the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I had like a big, big bash if I was, my 40th was her 90th or something, or my 40th will be her 100th, but it, no, it won't. We, uh, we throw it anyway. <laughs> well, we managed to, in the same year, it was mum's 60th and two of my brothers, 18th and 21st. That's pretty so, cool. Yeah, that, that, was, that's that, nice. was, that was a good year. That is a pretty special year. Speaking of special years, fifteen is a pretty magic that number. Sounds like I mean it's it's my go to number on any anything age like you know. Don't get me wrong, I've got nothing against a twelve year old or a ten year old or an eight year old, but most of the time, you know what I'm going to say after I have a mouthful of that whiskey, <laughs> right? When it gets when we hit that fifteen mark, you know, I I, th- I feel that 15 years for a lot of the, the whiskies that I prefer, especially the Islas, uh, although the full-bodied, you know, Spays or Highlands, that not that there's a lot of them, 
Uh, you know, that, I think that 15 mark you know, usually that's, makes me quite happy. That's yeah. what I think too. 15 is usually where, where the magic starts to happen. But I did, I did notice that when I looked at the bottle a couple of times, now it's obviously a space site because the distillery is within the region, mm -hmm. the protected whiskey distilling region, yeah, space site. This... But on their bottle, they call it a Highland single malt. Yeah, apparently it's done in a, uh, in a Highland style and I did my best to find out what the fuck makes it a Highland style as opposed to a Speyside exactly, style. Exactly, because I don't think, you know, I mean, sure, some of your Highland distilleries like Glendronic and others produce sherry finish malts, but I wouldn't mm. say that a sherry finish malt was correlated with a Highland style, no, would no. you? No, not no. at all. I mean, I may be wrong, but that's just not the assumption that I would make. But uh, yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I'm still confused as to... Yeah, it's on all the bottles. No, oh, it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going this way, aren't I? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We're going from the left. That was for you, Maxi. <laughs> so this uh, this whiskey's had a little bit of time uh, to sit in the glass, so it's Ooh. it's it's already got a fair bit going on on the nose. And we also, for the first time, we've got official tasting notes from the distillery as well. So we'll go through our stuff as per usual, but we'll read out the tasting notes at the end to see yeah, if we nice. missed anything and nice. just to you know, kind of uh, show the two different perspectives if, there. Yeah. If our taste buds aren't in our arsehole. Yeah, well. <laughs> but straight away, there's a lot of sweetness there. There is. There? It's really sweet. It's... Um, it's not terribly smooth on the nose either. Yeah, look, there's a um, wee bit of burn at the at the back end. Yeah, there's some spice from the wood that's there. There's a, a little bit of that toasted malt coming through. But you're right, there's a bit of a sting to it. Hmm. Kind of stone fruits, you know, maybe some apricot. It does have a, what I would consider a very sort of typical Highland aroma. Mm. Yeah, like it's, uh, there's some... Unless this possibly sets the benchmark for a lot of Highlands. Maybe it does. Yeah. But yeah, there's, there seems to be, I mean, apricot, maybe something that's something slightly tropical, but I can't put my finger on it. You almost actually the sweetness is starting to give way to like overripe bananas. And that's what, <clears throat> pardon me, that's what it might be. Yeah, that's um, top end tropical kind of mm. almost decaying. Yeah, yeah. It's like overripe bananas. Yeah, when they're the ones that you'd cook with. Ones yeah, you'd make or cake, maybe make yeah, cake out make of banana yeah. cake with or banana bread. There's something on that Not bottom good. end as well that, you know, is it, is it tea? That's a lot of, okay. I'm getting, I don't know if it's, yeah, if it's like your stewed stone fruits or like a plummy, plummy deep bottom end, like almost like a Christmas pudding fruit cakey kind yeah. of. Yeah. I think there's a, a hint of, a hint of maybe butterscotch. But then again, I just—I oh, yeah. always yeah. think of butterscotch when I'm thinking about whiskey because I want it to be there so badly. <laughs> no, I think actually, I think that's one of the most accurate things you've said so far. Well, I'd say it smells good in layman's terms. Yeah, good. Oh, surprisingly oaky. For all the sweetness that you get on the nose, surprisingly oaky on the palate. Hmm, there is. The wood and that first mouthful where you're just activating everything, mm -hmm. the wood and the, the pepper are obviously predominant. Which isn't uncommon for your first sip. There's a... It's very 
well bodied. Like it's not, um, it's not all sherry, all top note. Like there is some some firmness to the body. Yeah. Yep. And it's yeah, a they reason... haven't they haven't relied on the sherry. To... No, no, the sherry's a uh, it's a companion. Mm. It's not um, it's not dominating. The finish is soft, soft but long. Is would be my first impression from the first sip. Mm. After Still, that it... first sip, the the wood comes out when your nose again mm-hmm. for sure. Okay. I think there is a lot more oak in there now after that first sip. Yeah. Um, it's not predominant, but I think not... it's there. But I could be imagining it. Yeah. Not happening so much for me. I get just a lot of the sugars, yeah, a lot of like the yeah, fruit cake or Christmas pudding or and quite a bit of Decent amount of spice. There is a lot of spice. For a 15-year-old, it's more spice than I expected. Yeah, yeah, same here. Although that third sip just went down an absolute treat and it um started to expand. The um, I know it's very highly rated, the 15-year-old. Yeah, there's some pear in there as well now, I think. That's quite nice. All in all, not a bad tram, bad tram at all. No. Actually, that's yeah. Now that I'm on to sort of fourth, fifth sip. Yep. Yeah, I just hit third. That's just there. getting better and better. Yeah, it and is. Better. It's uh, as with as with so many, I mean, whiskies, but probably most spirits. Not certain. I'm. I tend to be a bit of a whiskey drinker. I quite like uh, a good tequila, but. I would imagine that in most of this kind of tasting, you, know, you need to activate and wake up a lot of those senses yeah, in there yeah. on those first couple of sips. Or well, sometimes, and, sometimes kill some of them too. And that's the other thing as well. But there's certainly a lot of adjustment. Once you, you're starting to get to those later sips, um, I think you're getting a lot more of what the whiskey has to offer as opposed to um, you know, just what your mouth can take, as it were. Hmm. Yeah, I'd say I'd say it's light lighter than I expected, but it's fairly well balanced and there's there's not really anything detrimental to say about it. I not like at all. it. Yeah, I not like it. All. It's a really nice fifteen year old. I you know, there might be something about a, of a highland to it. For me, it's more. It is a space site, and it's a sherried yeah, space site. I'll agree with you. It doesn't have that. Um, you've heard me complain numerous times about. Well, it's not so much of a complaint, but it's a, it's a minor gripe that I have with this. Is it highlands typically have something a tiny little aspect that I really don't like. Um, this doesn't seem to have that. No, no, I agree. In fact, it's. Probably what I was alluding to, um, that that's what I, whatever it is, and I think we both struggled to identify it effectively. We just know that it's there. Actually, speaking of um, sidestep for a moment, so struggling to identify something. When we had all the Tasmanians on, and and they are also the Ben Ramick organic. Yes. I was peeling a mandarin the other day, and I actually got that that exact thing out of it but it was um but the mandarin itself wasn't very nice yeah, it was right. like a, it was like a little bit old a little bit bland kind of it didn't have that nice tart sort of mandarin flavor um but it just yeah it just sort of blew me away as I, as i peeled it like, oh wow that's that's that missing link from the yeah interesting but i've never smelt that in a mandarin before <laughs> <laughs> So it was a bit of a long shot. Oh, I wonder if the Mandarin was from Tasmania. <laughs> I, um, 
have you uh, I think what would you say Rick when someone says to you this is sherry cask finished or sherry cask matured what would your assumption of that sherry cask be my assumption would be that this cask was full of sherry for I'm not sure how long they age it for but let's just take a stab and say three years and then the sherry was bottled and the cask was I don't know given maybe washed out uh, maybe even recharred and then whiskey was put into it now how how far off the mark am I Oh, you, you're, you're very far off the mark, but you're not far off the mark from what my assumption was as well. That's exactly how I you know, just assumed the process went. And what I would assume that most of the, the people I know drinking whiskey would you know, have the same assumption because of the way that it's presented in the, the way that it's written. And you know, because Glenn Farkless do do sherry so well, I went down this the bit of a sherry because I, I realised that my knowledge of the sherry cask finishing process was almost non-existent. Mine was... I made an ass out of me and umption. <laughs> now, I found a, uh, a fantastical... A fantastical... <laughs> I found a fantastic article. Did you give that one to Kerry King? I yeah. know, oh, that's a bit... <laughs> But I did. I found a fantastic article online, which we'll link to in the show notes because I, I, it's really well written. It's really well researched. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I've highlighted a lot of parts. I'm going to try and keep it as concise as possible because there's a lot of information here. Um, and they're, they're just notes, but we'll link to it. And shout out to uh, Ruben Luton. Uh, maybe Lighten. Maybe Lighten. If that's like Guy, then it'd be yeah, so uh, Lighten. Uh, so shout out to Ruben Lighton and for, a, for a, an article that changed the way that I saw things. But there's some good visuals in there as well. But the uh, what we think of... So sherry isn't aged the way whiskey is, right? So mm. with whiskey, you stick the spirit in the barrel. The barrel sits there for a number of years without being touched, depending on how long you're aging it for. And then every now and then you take a little bit of the spirit out to see where it is. Sample, and yeah. you know, When it's hit that goes. sweet spot. Now with sherry, it's actually aged in a, it's called a solera, solera but it's a system of fractional blending. So mm. cast... Well, um, we alluded to that in... Um, the I think the first episode. Task. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so solera has two meanings, the same word, two meanings in this situation. It is both the system of fractional blending uh, the the groups are called criaderas or nurseries i'm assuming that criaderas is nurseries in spanish but it's basically four rows of um cast the bottom cast being the oldest are called solera and that that's the the cast where the the bottom well, solera sherry comes from literally translates i believe to on the ground yeah so it's the bottom, the bottom row. But so you've got four levels of groups of barrels that all have wine the same age in them. Mm -hmm. And you only take wine, the, the sherry, out of the bottom cask. You can only ever take up to a third, mm -hmm. right? So the, the bottles are never empty. And you top up the third that you've taken out of the bottom with the one above it and mm -hmm. so forth until you're putting new wine into the top one again. So you've got this fractional blending thing that's very, very different to um, the way that we age whiskey. So mm -hmm. effectively, these you know, barrels, they can be used for up to 200 years. Yeah, so right. they don't get okay. sold. So these aren't the casks that go to mature sherry. Now, what? So to, you mean to mature to uh, sherry to, to, mature to, exactly. whiskey? Exactly, yeah. So they, these casks only mature right. sherry. They never have whiskey in them, and they are worth an absolute fortune they would be because of the way that these soleras work in underground places they a lot of them use natural yeasts that so the the barrels themselves need to be very um like it's a very time consuming process to get them seasoned so that the wine stays consistent mm. 
So the, the barrels in a Solera are never, they're, ne they're never taken away from the bodegas. So what happened in, I'm going to go, I'm, there's a whole lot of information here. If you're interested in the actual aging of the, the sherry itself, it's really fascinating. And we will put it on the show notes so you can have a look, but uh, we won't, I'll just you know, mention things as we go along. But so until the late 19th century, sherry was sold by the barrel. Right, so you would, in Spain, they would mm. send a barrel over to England, which was one of the main importers of sherry, and that barrel would go around to pubs and clubs and they'd draw off, and you'd be able to, this is in the old days, you'd be able to draw off a measure from a barrel, mm -hmm. right? Then as production went up and up and up, you'd get these, all the bottling happened in England. So you'd still have the casks would get okay. shipped from Spain and they'd be bottled in England and it cost too much to send the empty casks back. Mm -hmm. Now, these were called transport casks. So they were mm -hmm. a little bit different size, a little bit different thickness, mm -hmm. and they would be effectively neutralized, right? They didn't age the sherry. The sherries came out of those bodegas, okay. those yeah. Solera systems in the bodegas, and they were put in these neutralized uh, barrels. Okay, so there were the, none of the tannins went into the... Exactly. So yeah. they, they were trying, they tried to neutralize the barrels so that it were, didn't affect the wine that was already were there. Sh the original sherry casks... Were they charred as well? Yes. Yeah. Yep, yep. Okay. So charred, but then neutralized. Okay. Um, so these, you'd effectively have these new charred casks mm -hmm. that were meant for traveling, and they'd have all this mature sherry in it. Yep. So sherry that had been matured in the... The, the Solera. Uh, and then you'd go over there, all the bottling would happen, and then the cask wouldn't get sent back. So the whiskey you know, producers would buy them. Oh, beauty. A barrel that's had whiskey in it. So that barrel, even though it didn't have the sherry in it aging mm -hmm. it would have soaked up about a dozen liters they yeah, reckon yeah. the wood would have soaked up about a dozen liters so that's that was where it happened well that was how it happened how it started yeah. until like the early 80s and in the early oh, 80s right. uh sherry was the i think it was spain yeah 86 onward spanish law dictated that all of its wines had to be bottled in spain so that completely killed that industry. Now, the Scotch whiskey makers knew that was going to happen, so they'd already okay. experimented with a couple of things. Uh, one of the things they did was they got a a dense wine that consists of Pedro Jimenez, to which a syrup is added, and mm -hmm. then boiled down to make it sticky sweet. A liter of it was concentrated, so it was basically concentrated oh, well. sherry. They pour a liter into the cask and then use pressure to try and force, force that it into the all wood. the way around the okay. yeah. After a few years later, they realised that the results weren't acceptable, okay. so they stopped doing it. The other alternative was trying to reproduce the profile of a transportation cask. So, yeah, a, basically, a dude called William Philip Lowry, Lowry, Mark Lowry, uh, was a Glasgow whiskey blender that also operated as a sherry agent. So mm. they say he was the first one that. Um, basically came up with the idea of seasoning new casks with sherry and calling it a sherry finish. Wow. And that's exactly what they do today. So this is, the, and this was where it kind of got a little bit shocking for me. So I'm, uh, I'll give you a, a couple of quick quotes. Virtually all the current day sherry casks that go into the whiskey industry are specially seasoned for this purpose. Maturing sherry wines inside them is not an objective whatsoever, and the general idea of sherry cask being reused casks or byproducts of the sherry industry is a false one. Unreal. So, yeah. So I've, I've totally duped. Yeah, like, and, and uh, I mean, yeah, it's just a transparency thing, really. Like, it's, I don't know if it's intentional misdirection or if it's just laziness to, or if it, they just went, you know, it doesn't matter. We're just going to call it sherry cask. But I'd never well, thought it about it before. Sherry cask. But well, it's... it is. But yeah, so the but I guess yeah, it's it's two totally different industries, like two totally yes. different methods of yes. operation. Yeah, so. so the age the the casts that we use have not had aged sherry in them at all, mm. and they are not meant for that. They are specifically yeah, yeah. ordered by the distillery to be an ex sherry cast. So that they the the distillery will have an agreement with a Spanish uh, tonaleria, which is a cooperage that prepares new oak casks for them. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll use either American. Or European oak. The European's a little bit cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, 
because it doesn't have to come from so far and they use exclusively american oak for the solera cast because it lasts a lot longer it leaks less so it needs less maintenance okay. um but yeah, a new oak cask is compared to the cooperage. It'll be sent to a sherry bodega to be filled with wine, a process called envinado. Distilleries can choose from a range of parameters for the wood, the toasting levels, the age and type of wine that goes in, even the way of storage, upright or laying down. The wine stays in for a period of roughly between six months and two and a half years. One to two years seems to be an industry standard. When the seasoning is finished, the wine is taken out and reused. After a few seasoning runs, it will be discarded. The wine can't legally be sold as sherry, and it's not suited for consumption anyway. It's usually turned into vinegar. So every single oh, sherry yeah. cask is purpose-made. So it's a new cask that's had sherry oh, in it yeah. for up to two years, and then it's sent over. They leave, so they put a dozen litres of sherry in there to, no to season it. They send it over with that liquid in it, and then they have to pour it out when it gets over to Scotland because they don't want the barrel to dry out, and they can't have any additives. So the bottle, the, it, it's it's just very different to what I assumed yeah, that's, yeah. that it was. Yeah, I had no idea. Mm. It's, uh, so no idea. The, the basic... Um, the, 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 you could argue, because a lot of people, older whiskey lovers, say that older sherry casks used to be better. And, you know... Maybe they were. Mm -hmm. uh, and a, a quote again, after all, you could argue that modern seasoned casks and the old transport casks were seasoned in a similar way. Both are relatively young. Both contain sherry for a few months before the whiskey goes in. There's one major difference, though. In the old days, the transport casks were fed with mature whiskey. These days, the you know whiskey, there's, there's actually an image in the article of the sherry in the glass for barrels that are currently being aged for a distillery at the moment. And it's almost clear because it's so oh, yeah. young. It's almost like you, you wouldn't be able to tell that with sherry. Technically it is, as long as it's been grown, uh, they've been made in. Oh, that's, that's another little thing, but a little interesting side bit. But yeah, it's, it's just very, very, very different to what I thought it was. Same here. So, you've, you've, yeah. Because the... The other thing as well, and I, I didn't say know you, this. You haven't blown my mind. You've just opened, opened it right up. Mm. It's it's quite interesting, but the um, I, and another thing that I discovered in this little wormhole is that, uh, like champagne, you can't just call any, you know, um, any sherry sherry. Sherry has to be grown in. I've uh, got it here. The name sherry is a protected designation of origin under the European law. Only wines coming from a specific region can be called sherry. And that the, that region is the triangle between the cities of Jerez de la Frontera, El Puerto de la Santa Maria, and San Luca de Barameda. Uh, so if it's from outside of there, it legally cannot be cannot called be sherry. sherry. So, know. And this is the tie into Glenn Farkless. In 2014, Glenn Farkless presented a 1966 Fino expression. They invited a group of journalists to learn about sherry casks by visiting their cask supplier, Jose y, Miguel, uh, Jose y Miguel Martin, which is based in Huelva, outside of the official sherry triangle. This leads to the question whether a cask can be called a sherry cask if the wine is used to season it cannot be called sherry. In this case, Glenn Farkless chose not to mention the word sherry on the label, only talked about a Fino cask in official communications. Unreal. Yeah. Just interesting. Yeah. Know? Clever. But yeah. That is, that's, um, yeah, that's really opened my eyes up. Yeah, it's, um, it was a cool little rabbit hole to go down, to yeah. be honest. Um, and I feel a little bit smarter as a result. <laughs> or maybe just a little bit more smug. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, should we uh, should we try this twenty one year old here? Definitely. Oh yeah. I was gonna say what makes me smug. Twenty one year old. Oh, now that has depth. Now I like my whiskey like I like my women. Twenty one years old and mixed up with coke. <laughs> that has yeah, that's, a lot of depth. That's I'm going straight back to yeah, the fifteen. Way bigger. Yes, yeah, so much depth. Oh, geez, it doesn't it. Mind you, the 15 is now all banana. It, it's, it's all it's, tropical and. Yeah, it's, it's all, all banana. It's really top end. Yeah. Really top heavy on the nose, yeah. Whereas the 21, just that has 
body. This, I don't know. It's, it's not quite treacle or molasses, but it's... I, I guess it's just a, a really intense... Um, all that fruitcake kind of Christmas pudding. Mm. It's just really dense. Yeah, there's like a, a super golden syrupy. Yeah, yeah, golden you know, syrup kind is of, perfect. Um, yeah. Undertone to it that's bringing everything together. But you're right, there's those, the raisins and the sultanas and the yeah. glazed cherries, yeah. um, the cinnamon, the nutmeg. Yeah, it's, I mean, I know I've, I've just said this to, just about other whiskeys before. deeper version it, of it. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, there's that next level of depth there. Mm. And that, that's, I mean, it's probably coming from that extra six I, years I, in wood. I like it though. The um, like when we did the the Loch Lomond, how the eighteen was yes. just so far removed yeah. from the from yeah, the twelve from the, from and the, the 12 fifteen. And the fifteen, exactly. Uh, this is no. This is totally stepping in line. Yeah, agreed. It's a significant step up, but it's very much in line. Yeah, those those uh, bottom end. Yeah, you know, parts there. There's oh Jesus Christ. For me, I think there's a bit of leather or tobacco that's you know kind of just tying you know that that mid to that bottom bit together. Mm -hmm. It might be tea again. I think those things seem synonymous in my brain. They all I think yeah. they all kind of smell. They have the same type of smell, and I can't differentiate between them. It's just sort of uh, I think tea is like the high end. Yeah, of whereas like the leather would be the low leather end. Is a bit more. Yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe tobaccos in the middle. That is remarkably smooth. And I'm looking forward to the sip. Not as... Like, there's a nice robe on it, but... I don't know, for the depth of flavour on the nose, I just kind of expected a bit more of a robe. Mm, so. Expected a bit more oiliness to it, or... Just to... Just because it smells thick. I almost think the 15 had a better robe on it. But if oh, I was to... Wow. That first sip... Yeah, you're right. I think the 15 does have a better robe. That first sip is so deep. Mm. They're so Pretty amazing. smooth. There's none of that pepper. No, not 15. at all. Not at all. None. It just went straight down. It just, it, it's, you're right. It's not as oily as I expected it, but it coats the tongue as though it's oily. You know, it... it, it mm. It's like it's clinging to my taste buds yeah, because it loves them. And my taste spread, buds love it. It spreads really well. Again, good body to it. Like it is, it's it's a really well-bodied, well-balanced dram. And the finish on this is long. Yeah. And silky. Velvety, almost. It's thicker than silk. Mm -hmm. And it's super fucking smooth. In comparison, this really is a step up. The few times I've had it stand alone, I wasn't, I wasn't so impressed with it. But... There's a hint of smoke to it as well, not peat smoke, but you know, there's just a delicate, a delicate smoky flavour underpinning it. And that might be from the char of the barrels. I don't think, I, I don't um, taste any peat in there at all. No. And, you know, this is kind of, there's some stewed pears. Like it's it's not as, you know, like it's a little sweeter, a little lighter than that stewed stone fruit from, from uh, the 15. Yeah, the 15's gone turned into banana bubblegum now yeah, for me really has, in, in comparison. Just yeah. smelling it, it's yep. pure banana. Pure candy banana. This is, just... this is so much more decadent, smells thicker, smells not meatier, but like the metaphoric meatier. Like yeah, it's way so more much body, yeah. more substance it really to it. Is, it, it, has, of... it has balls. Yeah. I like balls. A lot of bottom end. But again, beautifully balanced. Mm. This is a fucking exceptional whiskey. This yeah. is tops. Jesus Christ. 
hopefully, hopefully we're headed the right direction from here. Although I've noticed the 15's at 46% and uh, the 21 and the 25 are both at 43. Yeah, right. I wonder if... No, it looks 3.5%. I mean, yeah, they're... They're aiming to you know, kind of hit consistency, aren't they? So, yeah. And yeah, I've been arrogant enough to question people's bottling <laughs> fucking strengths before and I shall do it no more. No more. No, that's Like lovely. the 15 is nice. This is, Jesus Christ, this is bloody great. 15's entry level. Yeah, 15's mm. something that... Yeah. 15's probably where I would start. Although I do have a 10 that really isn't that bad. As a standalone, it's um, Look, it's it, pretty, it wouldn't pretty be. good. But this 15s, yeah, where the magic starts. Yeah, like these this 21 guys... is where it gets fucking, yeah, yeah. exceptional. That's a fantastic whiskey. Mm -hmm. The 21, it is a genuinely fantastic well, whiskey. God, that is going down so smooth. Mm. Yeah, you can fuck it. You can get through half a bottle of that real quick. Mm -hmm. But colour-wise, if if I was to tell you to take a guess at, at which was which, you... No, it'd be very difficult. It'd be pretty difficult, yeah. And these the, guys... The 21's almost the... Has the richest colour about it, actually. Now, and I, I seem to recall, I could be wrong, but we can probably check. I think the 25-year-old is aged exclusively in uh, Oloroso... Okay. And him and his casks. I think, mm -hmm. I think I read that somewhere, um, but I would I would have to double check that before us letting people quote me on that. Oh, just the light. That finish is silky smooth. The warmth on this, like you know, there's on the fifteenth. On the, sorry, on the fifteenth. On the in the fifteen year old, there's a slight hit above the clavicle on the back of the throat of heat and then that you know that kind of follows you down your esophagus but it's you know and it's not it's not like a nas don't get me wrong but there's there's a tiny bite to it yeah there is no i was getting no, that i was getting that on there there's on no side. bite to the 21 it's no. just warmth Jeez. from the second it hits your lips and it's consistent warmth <laughs> through the teeth over the tongue back of the throat down past the clavicle and then that wall just follows you all the way down, and then it sits and spreads in your belly. Ooh, so nice. Yeah, that's... Exceptional. That is bloody great. Ah, well... But it is, for me, it is also Speyside Distillery distilling in what they... The Highland style. Yeah, but it really does sort of fit right in the middle. Kind yes. of thing. Yeah. Yep. It really does fit quite it far right in the middle of those two. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think it's a really good space side or a really, really good Highland. Mm hmm Yeah, yeah, you're right. Although something it doesn't seem as um But I don't know, space sides can sort of, it's like a blandness to them, I guess, in a way. It's a, I've always found like space sides very middle of the road, like they appeal to everyone. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah whereas this, this has more going for it than your average space side. Agreed. Far, far more. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, yeah. I, I would say that it was more of, ah, uh, look, I don't want to be a, I'd, because I'm a Islay lover. Mm -hmm. A lot of the whiskies that I'm most familiar with are Islas and Speysides because mm -hmm. Speysides are the most commonly Space found the most common, yeah, whiskies. Yeah. So, yeah, I I want to say, I, I almost said it tastes more refined than a Highland whisky, but I don't think that'd be fair because I don't think my sample size is, is high enough, but it's it feels to me like a refined Speyside. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and, as, and it, it lacks the, I mean, I think we've done, what, two or three Highlands? Mm -hmm. over the podcast so far and you know 
I would say I wouldn't call this a highland for the same thing that we mentioned before that the lack of whatever that thing is that we identify for for yeah. highland malts. This is lacking that. I'd say it was an exceptional space side. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it is a sort of. I know we've been saying like it's so it's so thick, like sugary, a lot of sort of yeah, golden syrup and raisins and. It seems to be on the lighter end of space sides, though. I kind of think, in yep. a way, yeah. Yeah, look, the, that's where that's where I'm like. It's got that. How a lot of Highlands have that, yeah, that heather honey kind of thing yep. going for it. This is where that sort of leans towards. It doesn't have that um as much substance as some of your space sides do. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and like so, where is a Glendronic sherry? is a full blown sherry mm -hmm. bomb. Yeah. Right? Because There's. you've got you've got those heather honey floral yep. notes of a of a you know typical Highland that then the, the sherry just rides on, you know, like an amazing mm. surfer and just, you know, kind of carves up in your mouth and it's just it's electric. Yeah. Yes. This is a little Certainly bit more uh, understated. Yeah. It's not a little quite bit more as, refined, yeah, maybe. Yeah. It's not quite as, as much of a sherry bomb, but it's got all those beautiful Mm. Um, influences, mm -hmm. but they're just a little bit, yeah, a little bit more understated, a little bit more refined. Now, I'd, I'd like to just quickly go through um, the range uh, of Glen Farkless, um, uh, or at least, you know, the the range I've got in front of me here. So they've got an eight-year-old, a ten-year-old, a twelve-year-old, a fifteen-year-old. 17 year old 21 year old yeah this is basically their core range isn't yeah. it 20, it's, a, it's an amazing core what range. an expensive core range yeah. yeah like i mean they've got a the, the family cars aren't part of the core range but you know the the 21 the 25 there's a 30 a 40 a 105 cask strength which i think used to be a 10 year old is now a nas okay and a 105 22 year old cask strength this one uh while well, you're on that 105 it was the world's first commercially available cask strength whiskey. Really? Mm. Well, it's also the whiskey that is required to be used in Glenn Farkless's cocktail competition. Yeah. Which um, the the first one was in 2019. Um, okay, so it's a it's a relatively young show. It, it yes, it was. Uh, it was won by a gentleman named Kevin Carr, who is a three year stalwart of the Urban Brasserie in Glasgow, and he took top spot with his green grass fizz. Uh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so Actually, was, my mind is conjuring up all sorts of crazy... Well, it would be. Now, I... I, I mean, I'm, it says green grass and fizz. I'm just thinking sherbet and lawn, yeah, lawn clippings. Yeah, or even champagne or something like that. But uh, now I started in I'm, another I'm life... I'm a very literal kind of person. <laughs> <laughs> in another life, I was a cocktail barman, and... Uh, this is something that would have been well beyond uh, my limited scope of imagination. But uh, the, the cocktail is a reference to Glenn Farkless's name, which means Valley of the Green Grass. Oh, yeah. Yeah, nice. Yep. So his, uh, his green grass fizz is a pale green creation using agave syrup, lemon juice, uh, the uh, Glenn Farkless 105 cask strength, and five muddled sugar snap pea pods. Now, what is what is muddled? Okay, so muddling is when you uh, you get this. Is that that little that, pound? It's that little poundy that's, that's, thing. Yeah, the, the big wooden thing that you. Okay, pound yeah, in the yeah, and it's yeah. got the crazy. Looks like a meat tenderizer yeah, sort yeah. of. So you kind of okay. and, and muddling it kind of just crushes. Uh, yeah, 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 so yeah. Just yeah, you just bashing up, like bashing up like yeah, yeah. You want a little bit of cell. It's almost on its way to pulping, I guess. Yeah, yeah, exactly yeah. right. You're just trying yeah. to release all those things so yeah, the flavors yeah, mixed yeah. together. But um, hmm. so yeah, the. Uh, so just a quick quote from the article. His creation was uh, certainly very different to the drinks of the other five finalists who tended to mix the compulsory Glen Farkless 105 with safer partners such as Sherry, Cassis and Benedictine. Um, he was quoted as saying, people have, people have an association with what things can go with spirits. My drink was slightly controversial and a little bit weird, but it does work. And weird is good because it encourages people to ask questions. Which, you know, I mean, cocktail barmen are wankers. That, that, that's that's not a denigrating thing. It's no, just, no, you, no. That's you kind of have to be. It's a special kind of wanker. Mm -hmm. Just like whiskey dudes that do whiskey podcasts are a special kind of wanker as well, right? <laughs> I've been both of those special kinds of wanker in my life. 
That's a, yeah, and I'm collecting more. <laughs> Collect it. If you're a scat, <laughs> yeah. you've got all these wanker badges <laughs> down your sleeve. Oh, I'm totally getting a scout shirt made up with wanker badges. I deserve it. I really do. Um, so the uh, a final quote was from uh, Louise Gallagher, Glenn Farkless' sales manager for Scotland and Northern England, and one of the lead judges. She said it had balance and taste. It was very visual. He hit the brief. It was very innovative, yet easily replicable in a majority of bars. Nice. Yeah, so he goes off to Glen Farkless to hang out with them and um, at the distillery and learn a bunch of stuff for uh, for three days. And, and uh, uh, I'm still still trying to get my head around. Oh, that's right. So here's a tie-in. <laughs> he also gets the chance to make his green grass fizz for thirsty race goers at the Cheltenham Gold Cup ah, meet in March. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Um, and just as an aside, uh, in 2019, drink away the trauma of <laughs> watching yeah, of several horses, <laughs> several horses get turned into dog um, food. But yeah, so the the competition was open to all UK bartenders. The three regional heats for the competition took place in Scotland, uh, Glasgow, Edinburgh, and Aberdeen. But the team of Glen Farkless are hoping to make it a fully national competition in 2020 with heats all over the country. Okay. So if you are listening from uh, that part of the world, check it out. No, obviously, I have no yeah. idea what would get what it. has happened with it with COVID, but um, worth mentioning. I thought probably not a lot. Uh, so did he make the same thing? In the heats as well. Do you have any idea, or did, I didn't, didn't uh, go that I, deep? No, I, I, uh, I thought that I would imagine that he. Ah, no, I'm not well, even speculating. I don't. Yeah, I, I'm wondering. Like, I can see both sides of the coin. Why would you change it up? But you might want to kind of keep it fresh. Yeah, you know, and just show your diversity. But it did say that because he, the first idea he had was to go with the color of green because of the whole. Valley of the Green Grass thing. So apparently he started experimenting. The original experiment was with uh, seaweed, but that didn't work. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, I've never used seaweed in a cocktail, but, um, you yeah. mm. know, I didn't do it. It doesn't go enough. too bad in one of those rice crackers. Yeah, true. Salt. I could also see uh, seaweed would, um, an isla would probably work a lot better. Oh, yeah. With... Yeah, yeah. Well, one of my, so I, I've, Probably the best cocktail I've had in the last 10 years. Might be the only you know, kind of fancy cocktail I've had in the last um, 10 or 15 years. But I went on a date, a Tinder date, with a, a, a nice girl. We went and had dumplings in a little bar and then were recommended as that bar was shutting down. We were still having a good time, so we thought we might kick on for another drink. And the staff went, we'll go to this cocktail place down the road. Now, I'd had a few, so I don't remember the name of the cocktail place. So I've only ever been there this one time. What suburb? In sit in the city. So it was around oh, okay. Yiddish, I think. Yeah. But uh, the cocktail that I had was had a measure of Talisker, ten year old in it. It had uh, I think it was banana liqueur. There was something else. It might have been Curacao, uh, so mm -hmm. orange liqueur. It was topped up with something I don't remember. It may have been pineapple juice, but don't quote me on that. And it was garnished with a candy banana, and it was one of the most incredible things I've ever. Do you drank. mean not one of those lolly bananas? Yeah, little candy banana. That was yeah, the garnish. Okay. Yeah. yeah, right. It was a cool cocktail. Hmm. I'll be damned. Yeah, you will be. I can see how candy banana and whiskey goes together very well, actually. It, like the the banana liqueur with the whiskey went together really well. The the yeah, okay. you know, candy banana garnish was just cute as fuck, you know. But mm. it was also delicious because I don't know about you, man, but I reckon my favourite lollies when I was a kid were candy bananas and musk sticks. They were up that, there, yeah. that was that was They're my kind of flavour profile and texture profile, you know. Mm. I liked them a lot. Oh yeah, but yeah, you're right. That fifteen year old is just. Banana banana bubble gum on the nose. And I was also and thinking compost. when you said they use Talisker, I was like, oh, fuck. You, a... <laughs> you can improve Talisker by just about pissing in it. So I had a feeling that you I, I had a feeling that you might sit there and go, it's about the only use for Talisker apart from whiskey <laughs> and coke. <laughs> but yeah, the that's uh it's real light, the fifteen, compared mm -hmm. to 
The Let's 21. The 21's yeah, yeah. got depth, but now, now we've got this, this 25. God, I've been looking forward to this for months. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'm not That's... that impressed with the robe on it. Mm. In fact, I don't know if I can say it's... Well, it's got a robe. Strange. I reckon impressive. this is... Okay. You know how, like, there's only a certain range of frequencies that we can hear? Yes. And when the the bass gets too low, well, it just drops out. Yes. I reckon this is kind of what's happening here. You can sense that it's, like, it's it's lower and deeper. It really is. That's than the 21, but there's... Step, but it's almost like it disappears off your radar. Yep. It is that low and that rich. It really, really is incredibly rich smelling. I'm getting, um, there is the tiny hint like... of that Highland Tang mm -hmm. to this, though, on the nose. I'm getting like a real rich banana sense from it. Yeah, but it's it's such a, a it's very meaty, tropical. It's such a uh, a really really thick and heavy like a, a banana molasses or something yep. like that. But then so there is there's, there's some malt in there as well. So it's almost like a banana loaf, mm. um, or a banana cereal. You know, if if there was such a thing. But you're mm. right. It's so heavy and it's, dense, and that is almost like all just disappears and leaves you with like a the sense of like the tea like a black tea yes exactly right there's there's a lot it's just so it's right on the edge of disappearing altogether mm. it's just so full on there doesn't appear to be any high notes to it there's not no, really but there's, that's, and i think that's there's no alcohol that... vapor to it at all uh there's there's no high notes where where that sweet candy banana is on the 15 that's mm -hmm. just been compressed and and pushed yep. Like, yep so all that highness is now compressed in this kind of thick band that operates yes. down the bottom yes you know it's, it's like it's almost and like smelling I mean, it under and then, pressure and then when it drops out that's where the tea like sort of yep. sits on the high and that's the only thing that i'm getting up yep. high this is heavy. This is deep. Super heavy. For me, there's there's a, a genuine, there's almost a mustiness about it. Mm -hmm. Like it's that compressed. But I'm getting, yeah, some really, really rich bananas. I thought this, I thought, yeah, the 15 was bananas. Now that's, that's candy bananas or, yep. or banana lollies. This is... This is cooked banana. Yeah, yeah, this is... This is a banana loaf. There is that, there is that tea, that... Um, you know, that black tea to it as well. Oh, I wasn't expecting that. It's got a bit more bite than the 21. Oh, I didn't get any pepper from the 21, but just no, no, I, I, got some, I got some from this. Too. Significant bite. Hmm. Jeez, what what a round finish. That's big. That's massive. I got a feeling this is gonna benefit from a drop. Mm. But Jesus Christ, there's so much going on in my mouth mm. at the moment. It's Fuck, and it's quite what, hard to take in. What a finish, though. Mm. Like, the length of the finish, the way that it fades. The way that it's... Like, I get, I, a lot of things sort of give me sh shapes. Yes. Um, And the way this is just pushes down and starts to spread out and sort of backwards. Yes. Yep, yep. It's heavy. This is proper heavy. It is. It's this is like the doom metal of whiskey. Yeah, it really is. You know, it's sludgy. Mm hmm You know, it's um it has characteristics of 
both the whiskies that came before it. Mm. It has the bite of the 15. Yeah. But it has the depth of the 21. Mm. But it's its own fucking monster. Yeah. That's for sure. And I'm... At the moment, I'd say the 21's doing it more for me. Oh, by a fair way as well. Mm. But, you know... But God, the, the, the amount of flavors in that. It's, it's so, so much more complex, on. yeah. yeah. It's, it's almost overwhelming. I was going to say, it's tongue. probably half the reason we've gone so, so quiet. It's, yep. it's a lot to process. It really is. I'm finding it difficult to tease out individual mm -hmm. dominant things. It's, I will say it's incredibly well balanced for the fact that it you know, is... Uh, is is it incredibly well balanced or is it slightly confused Rick it's it's or is it both uh, I don't know I'm going to nickname this one Splinters because it is sitting perfectly on that fence yep that's yeah it's a lot to process it really is I mean uh, don't get me wrong that's uh, that's a really impressive drain um, of whiskey Let's see, what did Camo say in when we did the Glendronic and he said he, that he did the Glendronic tasting and I think it was a Glendronic 18 that he was talking about the tasting that he went to mm -hmm. and he said this is the sort of whiskey you'd have on a date because every sip you just keep getting more and more out of it. Yeah. Well, yeah, this is doing exactly that for mine. Oh, every sip is a new perspective yeah. on this because there's so much going on in there. Like this is... um. Jeez, you could explore this for, for days. Oh, yeah, you really could. Mm. Ah. But, yeah, on the top end, all I can say is that that banana is really coming through um, with a nice sort of sweet malt. Um, yeah, it changes to like a sweet malt. Uh, this is mind blowing, actually. I think it's it's a sitting on whiskey. It's a whiskey that yeah, yeah. take. This isn't a whiskey that you can you know have a single dram of and know it and understand it. Uh, not at this all. is a complex beast that requires some mm -hmm. time. It requires some time to sit it requires time between sips the finish on the fucking thing is really long i find it um oh it seems almost like it's a it's a bottled paradox <laughs> like it's you go to say like oh it's this but then the next sip it's not yeah. that anymore yeah. it's gone the other way <laughs> well i'd like to um this is, yeah, I could explore this for days. I could get absolutely lost in this. I'd like, would you would you like to hear the, the official notes or would you like to, um, you yeah, know... I think, yeah, I'd like to hear anything I'm just, else as well. I'm just too confused. Um, yeah, that's, that's why I think maybe here that the notes will help. Um, yeah, I don't think um, in my short-lived sort of tasting career that, uh, yeah, I, I can't. I can't pull this apart very well. No, look, I'm I'm struggling as well. I think I pulled a couple of things apart, but um, I think the, the the notes may help us here. Um, we'll start with the 15 year old. Uh, the 15 year old is full bodied with super balance of sherried sweetness, multi tones, and peaty flavors. Long lasting, gloriously sherried, sweet, gently smoking, and distinguished. I'm not sure. If that's well, it doesn't it doesn't say no. much about like fruit or no nut it or... doesn't but that's that that was a synopsis okay, so I've got yeah. better notes for the twenty one and the twenty five and that okay, was cool. my fault I uh, I made an incorrect request uh, so for the twenty one year old color dark amber gold aroma intense full of aromas sherried fruit tropical fruit 
nutmeg and almonds with a slight citrus note to the end. Do you agree? The almonds is what got me, but I guess if I think about like, uh, say, amaretto or something. Yep. Then yeah, you kind of kind of get that. I definitely agree with the tropical fruit. Definitely. definitely. I think I think I recall mentioning nutmeg. Yeah. Um, yeah and possibly citrus. Almonds not not something I went to, but I suppose there's that um, amaretto is quite yeah, sweet. Like an almond, and almonds, almonds, almonds can pure. be like bittersweet aroma. So. I don't know, I eat a lot of almonds, actually. Um, that's pretty much a daily thing for me at work. I always have some mixed nuts. Um, I, I wouldn't... It's more an almond liqueur than an actual almond flavour. Mm. But then again, I've never been able to tie almonds in with almond liqueur. They're quite different beasts. So the flavour for the 21-year-old... Oh, it's fucking excellent. They say full-bodied, rich and rounded develops slowly into fruity and spicy flavors and they say so that, it wasn't getting so much spice on it at no all. It's, that the um, fruit there's a lot of fruit smooth, yeah. yeah a lot of fruit with um yeah like there's i think that that nutmeg and that cinnamon come through not just on the aroma yeah. but also come through on the palate yep. as well yep. uh, and they say that the finish is long lasting and smooth with a chocolate feel at the back of your throat oh yeah nice mm. yeah yeah there is there's a little like bit that. of uh, bit of cacao there i i would say the finish on the 21 is almost longer than the 25 agreed too. and it's but it's a little bit more subtle so i think that's why i didn't realize like it's why i felt that the 25 finished so long because i it's not subtle there is nothing subtle about this whiskey mm. this this 25 year old so let's see what glenn farkless have to say about it amber with dark gold highlights they're all, man. Yeah, they're all pretty similar they're color. They're all the same damn color, you know, honestly. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, I mean, there, there has to be a certain amount of marketing the speak, I suppose. You can't just say that they're all amber. The 21 might be the deepest of them all. 21 and the 25 of, of the bottlings that we have, anyway. Sorry, the the 15 and the 21 are all... 25, uh, the 15 and the 25 are almost all uh, identical in color. Yep. Yeah, agreed. Uh, so they say on the aroma, complex yet refined, with <laughs> with tempting. That's, that's like a such an art critic yeah. thing to say. <laughs> complex but refined. Yeah, yeah. Uh, brutal yet destructive. <laughs> on a subtle, <laughs> subtle. So complex yet, yet refined with tempting aromas of marmalade, honey, freshly ground coffee, sherry, and nuts with some oaky tannins. Good God, okay. They've been doing it for a lot longer than I have. They either have, either uh, that or they're a lot older than uh, I exactly. am. Exactly. And, you know, they're... Probably both. <laughs> coffee? No. No, I'm no, I'm not getting no. freshly ground coffee, no. Maybe, maybe green coffee? Like, as in unroasted. Yeah, there's definitely some tannins in there. And mm. a nutty kind of... I couldn't tell you what nuts it was, but... Something legumey, you know, like that. There is a, um, yeah, it's 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 not a spice. Marmalade, mm. you say? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I can I can see you know, the the, yeah. the, the, the sweetness of my. I'm not a marmalade eater, but I recall my grandmother being a big fan of ginger marmalade, and yeah. having that on her wheat bix for breakfast. Hmm. There you go. Hmm. So for the flavor, they say it's full-bodied and robust. The sherry and the oak fight for your attention, yet neither overpowering. Yeah, yeah I'll agree with that. Definitely full-bodied, definitely robust. It's yeah, you're so, right. So big and deep. It is, and, and the oak and the, the sherry do, they don't fight. But you, you're right. Like they're they're, it's like they're both. Yeah, you know, just mm. tug it on your shirt. Hey, you can't decide. Hey, hey dude. Yeah. Hey, you can't decide which one to give your attention mm. to. And they say, of the finish, intense, long-lasting, dry and malty, 
a beautiful chocolate taste at the back of your mouth to complete the flavor of the 25 year old it's, it's very malty actually yeah. super malty yeah and there is there is that kind of chocolatey feel not a taste but maybe a feel not so see i get that more from the 21 i found the 21 to be way smoother i agree mm. and yeah. um yeah just um more focused yeah more well-rounded Mm-hmm. yeah it's it's but yeah ask ask me again in 20 years i could have a totally different opinion oh that's fair enough now i suppose we should add a drop oh, i'm scared <laughs> yep <laughs> i get you it's um while oh, you're doing that i'll grab the bibble ah now i was very restrained here i added two drops for each and for the very first time i've actually managed to leave equal fucking amounts of whiskey in my glasses gasp not bad not bad who says we're not getting better at it and yeah, it's 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 very close to the time of uh, needing to to give put some numbers on these fuckers. Hmm. Oh wow, that fifteen is a different beast on the nose with the water. Far more subdued. There's nowhere near that um, candy, you know, banana bubble gum. Oh, geez, didn't it squash that? Mm, it really did. It's now, you know, much. Uh, there's almost nothing on the nose to it now, just the malt and the wood. Little bit of fruit. Oh, that's that's benefited greatly. Oh, yes, it has. Mm. It's subdued all that spice. Mm. And there's only the tiniest hint on the back of the throat of that now. Mm. Yeah, that's... Yeah, that's come a long way. Two drops in a 15 mil there. And... Yeah, I put I put about three in. All right, let's see what it's done to the 21. Mm, yeah, once again, that aroma's been hampered. By the mm -hmm. drop. Yet, I not like so it. much squash. I like it, just though. kind of just just brought back. Yeah, yeah. Half a just, level, you know. Yeah, the intensity is has lowered. But the balance is still there, and the depth mm -hmm. is still there. Hmm. Now that's gone the other way. There's a bit. Too much spice there on the back of the throat for me compared to what it was before. Okay. It's lost some of that smoothness somehow. I don't know if that's possible. Yeah, it really has. Yeah, it is spicier. I almost think on the nose it it's improved. But on the th on the palate, on the throat, like the throat feel. Yeah, yeah. On, the, on the throat there's spice there that wasn't there without the water, mm. which I find very interesting. Oh, wow, <laughs> a drop has not added, not changed this at all. No, it has. It has. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's opened it up. It's it's kind of yeah. I was I thought that this it might tease apart, tease apart the aromas and flavors. Yeah. All right. So let's go back to to the notes here. I'm. Um, yeah, look, I'll agree with the marmalade and honey. They're a little bit easier. Those those sweet kind of um, sweet but still fruity kind of notes that aren't sherry. I still don't get any coffee. Uh, so that... we've we've got a uh, the I think it's the Robert Tim's factory. Isn't too far away from here. It's only a couple of k's. And when the wind's blowing the right direction, I think I've probably said this before. When it's blowing the right direction, the green um, coffee. Yeah, the the as I'm I'm assuming they're roasting, when it gets 
when that smell gets super, super intense and almost goes beyond coffee, I can almost drag that out of this. But it's a man, it's a it's a long shot. I'm gonna go for another drop. I'll put two in. And now on the on the nose that's opened up again. I'm still not getting any coffee. But that honey. Mmm. And the tannins, the wood. Yeah. I I really like it on the nose after a few drops. Mm. It's um it just it's like nosing it after a few drops. It's almost like it's promising something different on the tongue. Let's see if it It just goes to, yeah, for me it goes to more high end. The that kind of what I would allude to as tea. It now starts to remind me of that Loch Lamond 18. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably... Hmm. I don't know if this has benefit from a drop. No, I don't think it has. I think the 15 did. I don't think the 21 or the 25 did. Hmm. I think um that 25 is a sort of... sort of whiskey you just... You do the uh, the Nick Offerman, big leather chair, fireplace, yep. crank a cigar, yep. and yeah, just these sit are... there. You could just sit there for an hour. Yep. On this, on the one dram, on yep. a 50, you know, 50, yep. 60 mil dram, and you can tell several stories oh, I'd while just, having that just dram. Just sit there in silence, yeah. just staring at the camera. <laughs> With a, yeah, that sort of semblance of a shit-eating grin. Yeah. Because you're getting paid to do it. Oh, I love Nick Offerman. Yeah, but a man. Yeah. Well. Yeah, that's that was I, that came from a place of, of pure envy. Yeah, <laughs> and that's fair. That is fair. Well, fuck. I think I think I'm ready to think about what I'm going to give these fuckers. Yeah, this is difficult. This is difficult. How exceptional? Well, I guess it. It's obvious that we both prefer the twenty one, yeah. I think I think the twenty one's probably going to get How exceptional is the twenty one? Look, I um keeping in mind, do we want a point of reference or Well I think the point of reference I think we gave flat nines to uh fuck me. I'm a little, I'm getting confused. We have done a few. What did we do last? Uh, the last we did oh, was, the, the blends. was the Battle of the Blends. Well, that was Ardbeg. Ardbeg, right. Yeah, and we gave some big numbers there. We but did give some big numbers there. Big, but, yeah, yeah, that was to be expected. It really. was. I, look, to be honest, I think the 21's probably on in a kind of a similar echelon as maybe the Glendronic, mm. uh, the R squared. Yeah. Um, for me, it's looking at real high eights, if not a nine flat. Um, Fuck, man. Actually, no. Okay, you did on the Glendronic. You alluded to the fact that you hadn't had much to eat, and you were getting pretty happy. Yes. What did I give it a nine two? Nine three. Yeah. Look, I stand by a nine. And he gave two. the OG a nine four. <laughs> no, so the IG OG should have a nine two and the the R square should have a nine flat. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's that's, that's uh, you were just you were just in the zone. I was in the zone. I was I was I was chuffed that day. I had a good time. This is why it's important to eat before you uh, you know drink eat whiskey, before you dram, ladies and gents. Yeah. <laughs> eat before you dram. Exactly right. Um, Actually, that's something I wanted to point out. I had no idea that a dram was an actual measure. Oh, really? Yeah, I had. I just thought it was like a colloquialism, Scottish colloquialism. Yeah, no, it's a really, really fucking small measure. It is. Well, a, a, um, I think it's like a, an eighth of an ounce a, or something. You're totally correct yeah. because uh, recently I went and uh, visited my parents. My nan came over for lunch, and she has to yeah, take fucking thirty-five thousand pills as most old people do. Mm-hmm. And my son 
yeah, being the the young stallion that he is, was enthralled with the medicine cup and just wanted to play. And mum had a bunch of them and um, just brought them all out. And he was chucking these little medicine cups, little disposable, recyclable medicine cups. And I looked at one, so I'd see all the measures on it. It had heaps of different measures around it. And I said, no, like one dram, two drams. Like, get the hell out. Who wants an eighth of an ounce of whiskey? <laughs> no, surely that's wrong. Well, you want a dram? Like, man, I want, no, I want 16 of the bastards. <laughs> like, but then I think, was it you that told me, no, like in Scotland, a dram is about 25 mils? Oh, it's, it's, so uh, a dram is, when they say a pouring of a dram is, yeah, yeah it's, it's about, round about a shot. So yeah, 25 so to 30. 25 right? to 30, yeah. okay. But an actual imperial uh, yeah, um, yeah, an dram actual proper is, I think, measure, about an eighth. Quantified yeah. dram. Yeah, yeah, eighth of an ounce, yeah, which yeah. is uh, three and a half mils. If it was a 28 gram liquid ounce. But I know we, we call a 30 mil yeah. shot an ounce. So it'd be somewhere between three and a half and four mils. Yeah, yeah. Which it's is not... Sweet a, FA. You would uh, not want a three and a half to four mil mm. measure of fucking anything like that's a drop or two like that, that there's well actually it's it's a few drops because this our dropper has does it have drams on it no but it has mills on there and and oh uh, so yeah so yeah it's, yeah three mil no and it's um oh seriously it's about 15 drops per mil yeah okay but it's, it's, it's still it's not fucking not, enough not yeah, exactly much, no. so <laughs> i could i could i could just imagine that you know the scottish people just in there go oh, i'll have a wee dram not that fucking way. Not that way. <laughs> <laughs> what is that, a drum shortage or something? Uh, you want to be a bit more generous there, Boyle? Uh, so, I reckon that the 21 is going to get my top mark. And yeah, the 25 and the 15 are going to probably get silver and bronze. Um, I'm not sure what my numbers are. In, in that order, yeah. So I'm wondering, yeah, I think I've been... There are other drams that I've enjoyed more than the 21. And for me, I know I like to shoot from the hip a bit, but for, I think I'm being quite sensible when I give the 21 an 8.9. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking 8.7. Okay. 8.7, 8, 8, 8, because mm. I think it's comparable to the OG, which should have, sorry, not the OG, the R squared, mm -hmm. which should be a flat nine. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a couple of points off. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to stick with 8.8 8 yeah, for the cool. 21. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you too on the, t the 25 is definitely second best out of these three eight four now nah, that it's exactly yeah. what i was giving it to yeah. and the 15s eight flat maybe eight one i'm gonna give it an eight one because i think it's better than an eight flat and i don't think there's yeah. as much of a gap between the 15 and the 25 as you would expect there to be hmm. um but yeah i'm i'm very much in line with that. I think uh, I think eight four is perfect for the twenty five. That was the very first thing I thought of. Um, I think we're in line in that. And yeah, I'm gonna I'll give you the fifteen and eight one. So eight 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 four eight one. Yeah, and what's yeah? I've given the twenty one. I enjoyed the twenty one point one of percent. Yeah, fuck yeah. More than you did. All right, the rev. Uh, where are we at? Oh, we'll start age order, or do you want to... No, let's do age order. Age order. Uh, 15, he's given 85.5. Yeah? Yeah. I'm on board with that. So, yeah, but let's say an 8.6 in, mm. in our money. Uh, one thing's for certain, working with sherry butts these days is a bit like working with Acme Dynamite. <laughs> You're never sure when it's about to blow up in your face. Uh, there's only minimal sulfur here, but enough to take the edge off normally magnificent whiskey at the death. Instead, it is now merely, in part, quite lovely. The talent at Glen Farkless is unquestionably among the highest in the industry. Yeah, I'll totally agree with that. Yeah, I agree too. I'll be surprised to see the same weakness with the next bottling. 
up to 21. 8-3. Wow, so he liked the 15 a bit more. Interesting. A chorus of sweet honeyed malt and mildly spiced teasing fruit on the fabulous mouth arrival and the middle compensates for the few blips. Yep. Okay, I didn't... I mean, he's, ha- he's always harsh. He's pretty harsh, other. man. Like, you know, I, I try and be the harsh one, but I got nothing on the fucking... On the Rev. And the Rev's got something against Sherry. I didn't think And he's was... got something against Sulphur, too. I didn't think there was too many blips on the 21, man. That was incredibly well-balanced, really well-rounded. Yeah, agree, but there's a reason we didn't give it a nine, yeah? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that would be the blips. Uh, the 25, he's given an 8.4. A curious old bat. <laughs> That's exactly what we fucking gave it. <laughs> By no means free from imperfection imperfect sherry but compensating with some staggering age seemingly way beyond the 25 year statement enjoys the deportment of a doddering old classic master from a family of good means and breeding oh, I like that metaphor mm. yeah I like that curious old bat it yeah. really really is I could yeah sip that with a massive cigar Oh, you could for days, and 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 it would change. Oh yeah, over and that I'd time. never, and I don't think I'd ever sort of <laughs> shoot straight by the end of it. I'd, no, it's it's it is it's, very it's all over the place in a very very good way. Yeah. Oh yeah. I don't think it's none of these are anything except great whiskies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, these guys clearly. Have got their shit together. Their family legacy is totally they, in order. You know, they they use traditional methods. They use a the fucking direct fired still. They got the biggest fucking mash tun in the industry. They've been doing this for six generations. Yeah. They're cluey enough to have gotten themselves out of trouble more than once. Mm-hmm. I mean, fuck, not a lot of people fucking still at a distillery after having a fucking contract with the Patterson brothers. Shh. You know, not a lot of people were able to. I mean. Most distilleries, if they lost their biggest contract in Diageo for their blends, wouldn't have the wherewithal or the smarts no, to start laying down their own hugely stock. Hugely demoralizing. They'd just go and fucking try and find another contract, yeah. you know, short-term thinking. Whereas, you know, I've got a lot of respect for the way that these guys yeah. have gone about the way they make their whiskey. I think their history is, you know, rich. I think it's clever. I like the way that they've found their niche spot well you know that they've decided that this is what they do well with the sherry they've got good agreements with the bodegas that they use in in spain um and that they're doing a really consistent you know product what a fucking core range from Mm -hmm. eight year old to fucking 40 year old got to be the most expensive in the business basically yeah that's fuck you know these guys get an absolute you know tick in the box for me and and i've really enjoyed exploring their whiskey yeah, same here. They should keep on doing what they're doing because they're doing it really well. So again, a shout out to uh, Matt Redden for um, you know getting in, uh, getting a bunch of information to us when requested and um, and for some insight. Uh, big shout out to Birdie for facilitating that as well. And uh, you know, it's it's really been a, a really pleasant mm. um, you know experience to to sample these really well aged. Complex whiskies. The only one thing that I rabbit hold on, I was really curious to know what the uh, the most uh, I'll throw eloquence out the door, the most family generations that have gone into a business. Yeah, cool. Have a stab. What do you reckon? Whoa. Okay. Cool. I know that uh, they say that most. Family business is usually the third generation is the one that squanders it. Yeah. Because that... they're the one least likely, because they were born into it, they're the least likely to give a shit. I'm going to have a, a stab and say 12. What if I told you it was a Japanese business? Oh, Jesus. 52? That's not too bad. That's not too bad at all. Hoshiri Akan. The oldest family business in the world, 
a hotel which is owned and run has been owned and run by the same family since the year 718. They are currently at their 46th generation. Oh, I wasn't that far off. No, I think you did it right. <laughs> They're not breeding fast enough. <laughs> was it on the, have kids younger. Was it on the Ferris podcast when he tried to learn that horseback archery yeah. and the guy had the jacket that said, like, yeah, they've, like since 1389 or something, and he's just like, wow, that's, <laughs> now that's a legacy. <laughs> oh. It's unfathomable, especially coming from a country that's not even 250 years old. Oh, exactly. Like, you know, fuck. We haven't even had a tricentenary. <laughs> yeah, I've I've drunk in pubs that are like twice as old as this country. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Crazy, isn't it? Yeah. I think that's about that's about it. I reckon we're done, buddy. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Once more from the uh the spirit of independence fuck as they like to say at Glenn Farkless. Slancher, my friends. Slancher.